That's another big advantage. When you borrow money from the bank or institutions, you're going to have to personally guarantee that note. In the world of private money, no personal guarantees. Welcome to the Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs like you exponentially build wealth through passive income to live a life of freedom and prosperity. Are you tired of paying too much in taxes, gambling your future on the stock market, and want to learn about hidden strategies for making your money work for you? And now your host, Dave Wolcott, serial entrepreneur and author of the best-selling book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy. Everyone, welcome to today's show on Wealth Strategy Secrets. Today, we're joined by Jay Connor. Jay has been a successful real estate investor since 2003, who started with modest beginnings. Today, we're going to learn how he teaches investors to raise private money without direct solicitation. After losing his bank credit back in 2009, he has since secured over 2 million in private funds. Jay is also a two-time national best-selling author and speaker on private funding. Hope you enjoy the show. Jay, welcome to the show. Hey there, Dave. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along to be here on your show to talk about my favorite subject, which of course is private money. And the reason I'm so excited about private money is in our real estate investing business, it's had more of an impact than any other strategy or anything else we've done all the way since 2003 when we started. 100%, Jay. Uh, I know this is going to be a great discussion. It's going to create tons of value for the listeners and, and really unpack, I think, you know, some of these secrets that people don't really know, right, about how to do uh, deals without money, how to access um, hard money lending, and how to try to figure that out so you can use that in your portfolio to really accelerate your wealth out of nothing. But before we get into some of the tactics, why don't you share with the audience you know, a little bit about your backstory and how you really got into, uh, into this wonderful world of investing with hard money? Uh, exactly. Well, I guess that, well, I guess the first thing I should differentiate is when I talk hard money, I'm speaking of a broker that actually has gone out and raised money for a fund, right? Then they lend it out to real estate investors. And so in my world of private money, we're talking about raising money from individuals, just like you and me, ordinary, ordinary people that are using their investment capital, liquid capital, and or their retirement funds to invest in our deals. Um, you know, self-directed IRAs. I never heard of private money or self-directed IRAs until 2009 when I lost my line of credit at the bank. But individuals can use just their liquid capital and or their retirement funds if they transfer those funds over to a IRS approved third party custodian, uh, then can loan out to us real estate investors. But my backstory, Dave, is my wife, Carol Joy and I, we live in this very, very small town that you are familiar with, Moorhead City, North Carolina, population 8,000. Our entire target market is only 40,000 people, and we do about two to three deals a month. Our average profits are $82,000 each deal right now. I don't say that to brag at all. I say that to make a point. You don't have to be investing in a large populated area to really make significant income. And in fact, there's an argument to be made that you have a big advantage investing in the smaller markets because you don't have all that competition that you do in the larger cities. And so I'm enjoying, and I have been since 2003, I've been enjoying being a big fish in a small pond because I just don't have that much competition at all when it comes to the deals. So we started, as I said, in 2003, uh, full-time investing in single family houses. We've done other types of real estate as well. We've done I've done shopping centers from the ground up, condominium developments from the ground up, but my focus has been single family houses. So from 2003 to 2009, I borrowed money traditionally. I went to the bank. That's all I knew to do. I thought if you need, if you're going to get funds, you know, for, I mean, I never even heard of hard money lenders, brokers, which is still institutional money. I hadn't heard of that. So the first six years, it was traditional. So what did I do? I went to the bank. I got on my hands and knees. I put my hands underneath my chin and I said, please fund my deal. Right. 
and had to pay origination fees. They pull my credit. I got to give, you know, financial uh, returns and et cetera. And on and they made the rules. Well, I called up my banker. His name was Steve. And Dave, you may find this hard to believe, but still here in Moorhead City, we have these things called handsets that have cords attached to them to an actual telephone on the desk. Anyway, so I was sitting here at my desk. I picked up my telephone in January of 2009. I'd already been doing the business for six years. And I called up Steve, my banker. I had two houses under contract that represented over $100,000 in profit between those two deals. And I called him up. I told him about the deal. Steve and I had had this conversation many times. We'd done many deals in those first six years. And I learned like that, Dave, that my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. I didn't have no line of credit. And I said, Steve, what do you mean you've shut down my line of credit? I got a great history with you, always making our payments on time, et cetera. He said, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on? I said, no, but now you've just given me a global financial crisis. And so I hung up the phone and I sat here for a moment and I asked myself a very, very important question. I asked myself, I said, Jay, who do you know that can help you with your problem? And by the way, these people running around saying every problem is an opportunity. I want to throw up. I didn't have an opportunity. I had a problem. I didn't have a way to fund my deals. So uh, immediately when I asked myself that question, I said, Jay, who do you know that can help you with your problem? I immediately thought of Jeff Blankenship, good friend of mine. He was living in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time, investing in single family houses. I called him up and I told him what happened. He said, well, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club? He said, the club of the bank shutting you down. They lo closed my line of credit last week. I said, well, Jeff, how are you going to fund your deals? He said, well, have you ever heard of private money? And I said, no. He said, have you ever heard of self-directed IRAs? And I said, no. And so I hung up the phone with Jeff and I studied private money. And so I put my own program together as to what I would offer people in my own warm market that I go to church with, go to the Rotary Club with, they're in my cell phone. I put my program together as to what I was going to teach. So, you know, the traditional way to borrow money is you're asking for a mortgage, right? In this world of private money, there's no begging, no selling, no chasing. What do I do? Well, I put on my teacher hat. Well, what's my teacher hat say? My teacher hat says private money teacher. So I simply just started teaching people in my own network how they could earn high rates of returns safely and securely without pitching any kind of a deal. You know, desperation has got a smell to it. And if you're talking about a deal and somebody becoming a private lender for you, you're already sounding desperate without, tr without even trying to sound desperate. So, how do, how do we have eight and a half million dollars that we just churn from project to project? Well, we separate the conversations between teaching the private lending program and how an individual can earn high rates of return safely and securely. They tell us how much they got to work with. And then we call them up with the good news phone call and we don't even pitch the deal. I don't even ask them for money. I give them the good news phone call and say, hey, Dave, I've got great news. I can now put your money to work. I got a house in Newport with an after repaired value of $200,000. The funding requires $150,000. Closing's next Friday. You'll need to have your funds wired to my real estate attorney by next Thursday, the hundred and fifty. dollars And by the way, I know Dave's got one hundred and fifty dollars because he already told me when I taught him the program, I'm role playing as though Dave is one of my new private lenders. And I say, I'll have my attorney email you the wiring instructions. And that's the end of the conversation. Notice I didn't ask, do you want to fund the deal? Of course you want to fund the deal, because particularly if you've moved retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA company, you're not making any money until I give you the good news phone call. So that's how we launched this thing. Never missed out on a deal since 2009 for not having the funding. And in fact, uh, we have a problem today, and that is having about a million and a half dollars sitting on the shelf from our private lenders waiting to be put to use. But isn't that a good problem instead of having deals and no money? I'd rather have the money because the money comes first and there's always going to be deals. 
Dave, I'm going to share this with you, then I'll turn it back to you. i tell you something that drives me crazy, and I know you've heard it, but it drives me crazy. These educators and, and gurus out there that are teaching real estate investing, they'll say, oh, just get the deal under contract. The money will show up. I know you've heard that. And I want to say, where? Where is the money going to show up? So think about how much more confident that you can be by making offers when you know you've got money burning a hole in your back pocket, ready to go to work. Yeah, very interesting, Jay. I think you actually really did take that problem and turn it into an opportunity. Oh, it was. It now became... now certainly propelled uh, your business 10x. So that was pretty good. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I find, you know, really fascinating about this entire space of really kind of alternative uh, wealth strategy and everything, and people don't talk about it too much, but it's really all about control. Right. And I think a lot of the conventional thinking, uh, conventional systems and frameworks put you into their machine and you have no control, you know, just like you were saying, you know, around the entire lending process. And we've all been through that process, even whether it's your primary residence, uh, a second family or a rental or things like that. And you're just completely at the whim of the banker. So coming up with alternative solutions and really kind of, you know, creating your own chessboard you know, where you are always winning is really what separates the savvy investors. So I uh, really love the concept, Jay. And uh, I'd like to unpack this further because I think this is a new concept for many people of really how hard money lending works. Um, I mean, what, what types of assets are you guys purchasing? Uh, do you have certain underwriting standards? Do you have targets that you're looking for around metrics? Uh, what about return profiles, things like that? Um, let, let, let's start to kind of walk people through uh, the process a little bit more. Sure, sure. So as far as the program or the underwriting terms, that we offer our private lenders, it's all the same. We don't have different deals, different rates with different private lenders. Cause after all, they talk among themselves, particularly if you are, you know, fishing or attracting money from your own warm market. Well, birds of the same feather flock together. And so first of all, the interest rate we pay is 8%. And I've been paying the same interest rate since 2009. And people will say, well, Jay, I mean, interest rates, you know, even at the local bank, I mean, interest rates are, are higher. I mean, prob you know, prior to COVID, the 12-month average certificate of deposit got down to 0.17%, 0.17%. And now today, you can go down here to First Citizens Bank and you can get a eight-month CD for 5%. And they say, how can you still be paying 8%? And I say, it's real simple. 8% is still a whole lot more than 5%, and it's not unsecured. It is secured with a deed of trust, which most people call a mortgage. You're in North Carolina. It's a deed of trust that collateralizes the note. So we're not borrowing any unsecured funds. Uh, you can use private money in second position for smaller amounts of money, such as for rehabbing or whatever, and we'll pay 10% on that money. So that's the interest rate. The length of the note is typically two years is the length of the note. Uh, the maximum loan to value, by the way, just as a side note, Dave, did you know that all 47 private lenders, that's how many Carol Joy and I have right now, 47 private lenders that are funding our deals. And by the way, if you're listening to this show, you don't need 47 private lenders. Start out with one or two and that'll get you going. My first private lender uh, started out with $250,000. But anyway, my land's Dave. I got so excited. I lost my train of thought. But anyway, uh, the interest rate's 8%, 10% in second position. Now, the maximum loan to value is 75% uh, total loan to value. So none of my private lenders, by the way, had ever heard of private money or private lending until I told them about it, right? I mean, this was all brand new to them. And so... When I say I teach them the program, I'm going over right now as to the program that I teach them. What's the interest rate? How you can get your money back in case of an emergency, total loan to value, et cetera. So when I say total loan to value, what I'm talking about is if you have more than one private lender being secured by the same property, which you can, you want to add 
all the notes up and divide by the after repaired value. I didn't say purchase price. Divide by the after repaired value, and that would be a total of 75%. So let's say that I have a house with an after repaired value of $200,000. Let's say I got one private lender that funds the purchase at 100000 and another private lender in second position loans 50000 So I add those two notes together. That's 150000 divided by 200000 There's your maximum total loan to value of 150. But however, as a side note, we always bring home a check when we buy the property. Well, why do we do that? Because we're borrowing more money than we need to purchase it. So if I bought a property for $100,000, it needs rehab and renovation, buy it for a hundred after repaired value of 200. Well, if I buy it for a hundred and I borrow 150, I'm bringing home a $50,000 check excess cash to close on the real estate attorney's check stub. And of course, I'm going to use most of that $50,000, you know, for the renovation or the rehab. So that's the total loan to value. We give our lenders what's called a 90 day call option in the promissory note, which means if they have any kind of emergency come up, they just give me a 90 day notice. That's plenty of time to replace their private money on that deal with another one of our private money lenders. And then uh, we, as I said, we collateralize the note, but we also give our private lenders further protection. We name our private lenders as the mortgagee on the uh, insurance policy, the property and casualty uh, insurance policy. So if there's ever a claim against the property, the insurance company is going to make the insurance check payable to the mortgage lender, the private lender, and to our company as well. And so it's not unsecured. It's backed by the real estate that we are purchasing. By the way, as a side note, private money is not only for purchases. You can use private money on a property that you already own free and clear, or it's got equity in it. And if you need to pull cash out of it, then you can refinance that property that you already own with private money. So those are the main ways that we're underwriting the deal and protecting our private lenders. What if everything you thought you knew about investing was wrong? Would you like to create a wealth strategy like the top 1% have and get exclusive access to top private equity deals that provide downside protection, tax efficiency, predictable cash flow, and have a lucrative upside? Discover how with the Pantheon Advantage and join our investor club today at pantheoninvest.com. Com. Yeah. Okay. Tell us, um, you know, from the consumer perspective, right? What, why would someone be looking for private money lending? Is it because they can't get traditional financing? What, what are the top use cases of, uh, you know, what someone's looking for? And assuming you're only talking in this case of single families. Yeah. Well, I got 15 reasons I love private money over institutional money, but I'll give the main ones in no particular order. Number one, and you alluded it, alluded to it, Dave, when you said control. In this world of private money versus the bank or commercial or hard money lenders or brokers, they're making the rules. They're setting the interest rate. And this is one of the big things I had to get wrapped around my head when I first started doing it. There's no begging, chasing, selling, persuading. It's all about attracting. And so we're, we're leading with a servant's heart and educating people. So when you go into the bank, they're making the rules. In this world, we're making the rules. Number two, cash flow. So all private money deals that I do uh, are essentially a no down payment deal because I'm not having to take, I never have to take any of my own money to the closing table when I'm purchasing. I'm getting 100% financing for the purchase. And then if there's renovations involved, I'm getting all that money up front as well. Thirdly, there's no origination fees. So there's no points, no origination fees. We just pay a straight 8% or 10%. Fourthly, in addition to that, I mentioned earlier, we always bring home a big check uh, when we buy. In addition to that, my credit score's got nothing to do, your credit score's got nothing to do with how much private money you can get because private money is a collateral-based note. Private lenders are never going to pull your credit score. Uh, first of all, they don't even have the ability because these are individuals, you know, just like 
you and me. Another big reason is fast closings. I mean, when you're, when you're borrowing institutional money or doing business with the bank, I'm surprised anything ever closes. I mean, you know, you're looking at at least four weeks or more to be able to close. Some hard money lenders can do three weeks. But in this world of private money, I can actually close in three days on a deal. I make all of my offers that I can close in seven days. So speed wins more offers being accepted. Another big reason, there's no limit to the amount of private money that I can be borrowing. When I was borrowing money from the banks, there was a limit to the, to the amount of money I could have at any given time. In addition to that, there's no limit to the number of private lenders that I can have. And it doesn't matter where they are. They don't have to be in the state where you're doing business. They can be anywhere. They can be out of state. They, they can be international. The reason for that is that private money is not regulated by the commissioner of banks like institutional money is. So the list is very long. It just puts you in control of your business. Sure. And then how about for the consumer, right? So if you're uh, doing that type of lending, is are you typically working with consumers that are looking to basically purchase a single family residence, a second home? I mean, is there some type of niche that you're going after? Is there a certain price point that you have kind of defined to really manage your risk and understand who that consumer is? Now, when you say consumer, are you talking the real estate investor or the private lender? I'm talking the person who is getting the actual loan. The, the borrower, the borrower. The borrower, right. yeah. Yeah. So in my case, and you would want to share this with your private lenders, in my case, you want to let your private lenders know what your geographics are. So everything that I'm investing as the borrower is all right here in Carteret County and Craven County, right around where I live. Secondly, as far as my price points go, that really doesn't matter to the private lender because all they have available is all they have available. I do have minimums. So my minimum loan amount that I will borrow is $50,000 from a private lender. Uh, used to, it was $30,000. But um, as far as the properties that I'm investing in as the borrower of the private money is single family houses up to a million dollars because, you know, we've got luxury homes here uh, at the beach. And so that million mark and under is what we operate in. Most of the time, most of them are around the median price point, which is now uh, right around $350,000. Got it. Because I think there's two, you know, there's two opportunities for people here, right? right? You know, one is that borrow borrower, right, who is looking to say, hey, I'm, I, you know, yeah, I can't get bank approval or something, or maybe I'm just trying to get an investment property, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, they won't, they won't let me do that for whatever reason. So this could be an alternative play to get that second home, that Airbnb, um, you know, the single family rental or something like that on the side is a, is a good alternative solution. And at 8%, um, you know, that's, that's definitely a qualitative loan. So, and then you typically hold those for 24 months on average. So then what, what happens after that? Do people typically convert to conventional at that point? Well, if it's a buy and hold, then after you've got it seasoned with rental income coming in, if renovations were needed to be done, you got that done. So I'm typically not going to be holding um, for the long term a single family house or an Airbnb, short term rental. I'm typically going to refinance if I'm on hold it with conventional money, but I would use private money to get in the deal. Uh, yeah. Most of our deals that we're doing today are actually flips because the market here, there's no inventory in the multiple listing service. So all the houses that we buy now are what we call off market houses. So we use, you know, Google pay per click, Facebook ads, direct mail campaigns, outbound calling, et cetera, to find the deals. And when we get them renovated and put them in the multiple listing service, they're going, I just listed a house a couple of weeks ago on a Friday and by Sunday, we had 22 showings on that one single family house. So most of the time today I'm using in this market, I'm using private money for the flips. 
but you can use private money as I have in the past a lot, uh, get in and then refinance if you're going to hold it for the long term. Yeah. Jay, what have been the top lessons learned in doing this business for the past 20 years? <laughs> well, I learned one lesson the hard way, and that is don't start out in this business by yourself without working with somebody that knows what they're doing, for goodness sakes. So don't start out there on an island. Um, I, I relied on my mobile home experience. Um, I don't know if you remember the days, uh, Dave, when you lived here in the area of Connor Homes or Connor Mobile Homes. Uh, it was pretty large at the time. Um, and that was my father's business, actually. Uh, but anyway, I was relying on that experience and just reading books. So don't make my mistake in that regard. And here's another really, really big mistake that I made when I started out that you don't want to make. And here it is. I bought this condominium. Uh, it was a foreclosure at the courthouse. I bought this condominium that was over at Atlantic Beach. And um, my intention was to flip it. That was my intention, was to buy it, renovate it, and flip it. Well, by the time that I got the renovation completed and I'm putting it in the multiple listing service, the market had already started coming down pretty quickly and I didn't get it sold in the multiple listing service. So I had no choice but to put it on the rental market. Well, guess what? A condominium at Atlantic Beach pretty much only has 13 weeks of rental income, and that's from Memorial Day until Labor Day. Most of the rest of the time at Atlantic Beach, it's going to be sitting vacant. And so here's the mistake. And it was a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath because here's the mistake I made. I did not calculate my carrying cost and compare that to what rental income I could bring in in case I had to rent it out. So the lesson learned is, is even if your intention is to flip it, you better run the rental scenario in case you got to rent it out and make sure it's a positive cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great point. And have you uncovered any uh, particular tax strategies around uh, doing private lending as well? Uh, tax strategies. Well, one definitely relates to self-directed IRAs. So when a private lender is borrowing money, I mean, when a when you, the real estate investor, is borrowing private money from a private lender and the lender has moved retirement funds over to a self-directed IRA company and now they're loaning it out, and so they are a passive real estate investor, then they're, the, from their side of the, of the desk, the income that they earn, the interest that they earn on that money is either tax deferred or it could be tax free if their retirement account is a Roth IRA because Roth IRAs are created with after-tax dollars. Uh, the sure. benefit to you as uh, borrowing the private money, then obviously uh, the interest, you get to write all that interest off. Um, so you've got that tax advantage as well. It's a write-off for your company. Got it. And if you could give just one piece of advice to our listeners, Jay, about how they could accelerate their own wealth trajectory, what would it be? Use other people's money because your money eventually, unless you are Bill Gates or somebody, is going to run out and you're not going to be able to scale your business. I hear it all the time. Real yeah, estate rich that? and cash poor. Here's another big <laughs> benefit to using private money. Did you know that when you're using private money and if you have to give someone your financial statement, you do not have to put your private lender loans on your financial statement. Why is that? Because private money is not personally guaranteed. It's backed by the real estate. That's a big advantage right there. Help your financial statement look much, much healthier without having to report personal or uh, private lending loans. You know, that's another big advantage. When you borrow money from the bank or institutions, you're going to have to personally guarantee that note. In the world of private money, no personal guarantees. Yeah, that's a good one for sure. What's your top personal productivity hack? Uh, the rule of five. The rule of five, 
which I learned from Jack Canfield some years ago. And the way the rule of five works is before the end of your workday, you identify the top five activities or things for you to do or work on the next day. And you identify that instead of getting up in the morning and running around with your hair on fire. Um, so identify those important activities for working on your business. That's where you really make the money is how are you working on your business, improving your business uh, instead of being in the business all the time. And I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more uh, hack as well on efficiency. And this is a quote that I coined, and that is successes are scheduled. I really don't like to do list. If it's important to be on the to do list, it needs to be on my calendar as to when it's going to be done. So you can do time blocking. You can do 90 minute time blocks on your calendar as to when you're going to work on maybe more than one item that's on a list, but get it scheduled and identify it at least the day before. Get it on the calendar. Good one. Love it. Jay, it's been really a pleasure having you on the show and really unpacking your wisdom on private lending, uh, which is, has been very insightful. Uh, and I know that you came to the show today with a special gift uh, for the audience. So if you'd like to uh, uh, share that with the listeners, that'd be great. I would love to, Dave. So I finally wrote my book on private money as to how you, the uh, borrower, the real estate investor, can get all the money you need for your real estate deals. The name of the book is Where to Get the Money Now. The subtitle is How and Where to Get Money for Your Real Estate Deals Without Relying on Hard Money or Traditional Lenders. This is not an ebook. This is an actual book book, physical book. Uh, it's on Amazon for 20 bucks, but I'd like to give it to you here on Dave's show for free. Just cover shipping. I'll autograph it and we'll send it out to you three day priority mail. And you can pick up the book at www.jayconner.com forward slash book. Again, that's jayconner.com forward slash book. And I'll rush it right out to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jay. Appreciate it. Dave, thank you so much for having me. God bless you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wealth Strategy Secrets. If you'd like to get a free copy of the book, go to holisticwealthstrategy.com. That's holisticwealthstrategy.com. If you'd like to learn more about upcoming opportunities at Pantheon, please visit pantheoninvest.com. That's pantheoninvest.com. 